Our scripture reading this morning is Romans 6, 1 through 14. If you would stand with me as we read. Romans 6, verses 1 through 14. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who die to sin live in it? Do you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For we have been united with him in death like this. We shall continually be united with him in the resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died that Christ has, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let no sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey its passions. Do not present yourself members to sin as inherit, as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are no longer under the law, but under grace. This is God's word. You may be seated. Thanks, Kristen. Um, good stuff. Well, we can we can sit down and head out right there. That was. Uh... As we dive into Romans six, we're more than a third of the way through the book at this point, which is amazing. But quick review: What's Romans one through three about? Putting everyone on the spot for a pop quiz. The condition of mankind, everyone's bound under sin, right? Like the, f- the first few verses, Paul's like, hey, guys, what's up? And then, you know, I'm thankful for the gospel because it saves people, but we need to realize everyone's stuck under sin. That's like Romans 1 through 3, right? Romans 4. Any recollection of Romans 4 and kind of just summary? It's okay if you don't, but still going to pop quiz regardless. So Romans 4, we're saved through faith, just like Abraham was, just like David spoke of, that this is not something new. This is what God's been doing all along, rescuing his people through faith, not by mere works of the law, however defined. Chapter 5, the past couple weeks, it's kind of like summary thoughts from chapter 5. Reconcile to God. Not in Adam, but in Christ. So those kind of themes that like Jesus paid for our sin while we were still sinners, we're reconciled to God, we're in Christ, not in Adam. We are rescued and given life. So that brings us up to Romans 6. This flow where we're seeing the whole world's condemned, but there's a solution that God has paid for, and it's found in faith, and we're found in Christ, and therefore we have hope. So we turn to Romans 6, as Christian just read. But as we... Get ready to start into Romans 6. First, I have a very serious question that we need to answer. We know it's a serious question because it was found on Quora.com, where the people of the world go to ask the very serious questions of life. Found it this week while I was studying and preparing for the sermon, and I felt like it was very apropos. And so, <clears throat> Michael, if you can throw that up there, and just, it's a, we don't have Megan in here to answer, so you guys are going to have to help answer this one. Can't people with allergies eat the food they're allergic to, and then stick the EpiPen in their arms? So I'll just let that settle for you a second there. If you can imagine the scenario that this person felt was, was worthy of asking online, 
You got a deathly peanut allergy? Eat those peanuts and then just pull out that pen. Yeah, all right, give me some more. Yeah, <laughs> just pop the peanuts. It's good. Sports game. Yep, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. more every pen. This is good. <laughs> they got all sorts of appropriate answers, um, both sarcastic and serious, to that question, pointing out that, you know, EpiPen is because you're about to die, dude, and all it is is steroids to keep you alive till you get to the ER, pointing out that EpiPens cost, you know, 300 hours a pop. This is not exactly a cheap habit to maintain if you were to do this, et cetera. But the reason this is important is because it actually has a really good comparison to what we're looking at in Romans 6 in this first question. So let's pray, and then we're going to look at Romans 6 and why EpiPens and allergies are similar to the Bible. God, would you... Please be with us today as we look at your word. Spirit, I pray that you'd take what has already been said and sung, that you would take the things that I will say, the things that are here in Romans 6, and that you would speak to our hearts, that you'd be magnified, that you would be making yourself known to an even greater degree, that you would be showing us how we can be more like Jesus, how we can be more reflective of the family in which we live by your grace, the eternal family that we're a part of that we would go from here worshiping you and changed by you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, EpiPens and allergies, grace and sin. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Should I keep eating my allergic food and pop some EpiPens? Answer, and you might recall this from several weeks ago, the answer in English is by no means, but the answer in Greek, I know I have at least two people who are going to remember this, although they're not listening. <laughs> Jane and Elena, let's, do you remember the Greek word or phrase? <laughs> okay, they don't remember it. It's fine. Me genoita. And I'm, this is like the only Greek thing I've ever taught you guys, but I'm teaching on purpose because I think it's great, and I think it sounds so much better than by no means, especially because it basically, if I'm translating it to modern 2024 slang, it's when that kid looked at you in your teenage years and you were going to do something, he said, don't even think about it. That's, that's what we're looking at here. The may portion is a negation, a, a never, or lest, or not. Right? And genoita is the verb that means to become or to come into existence. So are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? May it never even come into existence, like in your brain. Like why would you even think this? So as we're looking at this text, Paul's starting with that question as he develops this, this whole thought through Romans 1 through 3, Romans 4, Romans 5. We just got done last week with David pointing out in that in Christ we are saved and there's grace and we're not bound under sin. So then Paul turns to this question, well then, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? Because if you look back at verse 20 of uh, chapter 5, now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So therefore, verse 6, verse 1, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Because hey, where sin increased, grace increased more. So as we look at this text, Paul's starting us with this question in this absolute, may it never even be considered, meganoita. And then we're going to dive into verses 3 through 11. He explains, hey, are you ignorant of this fact? And he develops what it really looks like to be part of what Christ has done, to be in Christ. And then at the end, in verse 12 to 14, he kind of rewinds back to verse 2. He's like, so therefore... Don't let sin reign in you. Don't let sin be the one that's ruling in your life. So it's like, should I continue in sin? Of course not. Come on, don't you get this? Therefore, the answer is of course not. Okay, so that's what we're going to see as this develops. But if we're trying to summarize this all in one piece, you have it there on the notes. Don't enthrone sin. Live free in Christ. Enthrone, a verb meaning to put on the throne, right? Don't enthrone sin live free in Christ. And we'll see why it is that it's enthroned and not just like serve or whatever. But we can keep that in mind as we look through this. That's really like the summary call if we're looking at what the Spirit's saying here, what Paul's saying here. That's the call to us, that we get to live out the freedom we've been given. So first of all, presuming on grace should be unfathomable. 
This is what we see in Paul's response to this question. Are we to continue in sin that grace may be abound? Let it never be. Meganoita. Like, <laughs> this should be unfathomable to ask this question. Just like saying, should I just eat all the stuff I'm allergic to and stab myself with an EpiPen six times a day? Like, that's unfathomable. Why, why would you even think that? It doesn't make sense with the way that life works. This doesn't make sense to Paul with the way that renewal, regeneration, being part of God's family, being in Christ, works. This isn't just a club that you sign up for and you're like, no, I got the card. I can do whatever I want. Like, no, that's, that's not the point. It should be unfathomable. And the sad thing is that at various times, we tend to think of sin more like a really well-done sports play. We might even think of it kind of like an alley-oop. There's a famous image that we're going to pull up on the screen that some of you have seen before. This is Dwayne Wade at the front of the screen, flying past the cameraman, and that's LeBron James up in the air, having caught a pass from Dwayne Wade in midair with one hand, and he's about to slam it through the net. Dwayne Wade's stance, yeah, man. Like, he knows it's about to happen, and he hasn't even seen it happen yet, because they were in sync, and he threw the ball up, and he just, he just knows. And so he's, like, celebrating what hasn't happened. That's the attitude we sometimes unintentionally take towards sin. If we're asking the question, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? Like, here you go, Jesus, alley-oop, throw that grace down. That is not the point of sin. That's not the way it works. No, this is, your sin is killing you like an allergy that, is, that you're deathly allergic to. And grace is not the EpiPen that you're like, yeah, I'll use it all the time. It shows how cool the EpiPen is. No, grace is the thing that hyperabounds greater than your sin in order to save you from death and to make you new and to redeem you. It's not an alley-oop that we should rejoice in and say, yeah, we'll continue in sin that grace can abound. This is a category distinction. It's very different things. On the one hand, with an alley-oop, you're setting someone else up to look good. You're having a fun play, etc. It's a good thing that starts a different good thing. Sin is not a good thing that starts a different good thing. Sin is a bad thing that, that is death to you without the intervention of grace and what Jesus has done. Ultimately, if we're asking this question, we, we really find ourselves in a place where we're presuming forgiveness rather than appreciating it. And when I, when I put it in terms of being an alley-oop, we probably go, that's ridiculous, and you know, see through it. When we think of talking about allergies and stabbing EpiPens repeatedly throughout the day or whatever, it, it sounds ludicrous, and yet... We presume on God's forgiveness and don't appreciate it a lot in life. The, the actual reason for why we're forgiven, the, the weight of our sin that necessitated rescue, the, the fact that I did something horrible and many somethings horrible and I'm bound in sin, and that's an awful thing that needs forgiveness. Sometimes when we're in life and we're trying to guide our children through the personal interactions of you've offended someone and you're apologizing and you're, you're like, okay, now say you're sorry. Sorry. No, no, say it like you mean it. Sorry. You need to ask them for forgiveness, you know, and say that you're sorry for real. And you eventually, you kind of get them to say, I'm sorry. And you're like, okay, that's good enough. You at least said it like a human. But generally speaking, in that interaction, the child doesn't know or care that there's a weight of something they did that they need to be forgiven for. You can see the difference. When someone says, that hurt you. I'm, I'm so sorry, that was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said it that way. I can see how it impacted you. Versus going, sorry, can we, can we move on now? When we don't appreciate forgiveness, we don't appreciate the weight of our sin and the weight of what's being done. One, it doesn't actually make for reconciliation. <laughs> Like, the other person knows the difference. Like, uh, you, okay, you don't actually care. You just want to get on with life. Right, okay. But part two, you don't actually get to experience the full joy of the freedom you've been given. <laughs> when you don't comprehend the depth from which you've been pulled, you can't rejoice at the heights to which you've now been raised. Sin's not an alley -oop. Forgiveness matters. And if we find ourselves lost in this, this idea that, oh, I'll just keep sinning, it'll be fine, we're having a very irrational rationale, a very irrational way of thinking about our sin and trying to say it's no big deal, when really it is a big deal. And it's okay to admit that it's a big deal because of what Jesus has done. 
I don't have to downplay what I've done. In fact, it's a good idea to stare it full in the face because then I can see how great the redemption really is. It doesn't mean I have to be like, oh, I'm a worm in the mud and I'm never anything good and I'm just horrible and like beat myself up in some sort of kind of prideful, fake self-pity. But it does mean I can look square in the face of what I've done wrong, admit what I've done wrong, and rejoice in his goodness. Rejoice in the fact that he has saved me from that and I don't have to, to stay in it. So Paul leads us from those first questions. Should we continue in sin that grace may be, may be abounding? Can't speak. Continue in sin that grace may abound. By no means. Don't even think about it. It's not worth considering. But do you not know, verse 3? And in verse 3 through 11, he unpacks two key truths, which we'll take in order and kind of review them. First, in Christ we died. This whole thing is is revolving around what's true about us in Christ. So in Christ we died. Verse 3, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? There's something to realize about this section of Scripture, verse 1 through 14. Sin is repeated ten times. Death and its variants, like verbs and noun forms, repeated 15 times. On the other hand, life is repeated seven times, raised or resurrection is repeated three times, and in Christ or with Christ is repeated ten times. So you can see the contrast. Death, life, burial, in Christ, raised. That's the whole interplay that Paul's pointing out here. So it should be no surprise that we see him repeating this even in verse 3 and 4. He's just said we're baptized into his death. And then verse 4, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death. So in Christ we died. This continues, verse 5, for if we've been united with him in a death like his. Verse 6, we know our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Verse 7, for the one who has died has been set free from sin. Verse 8, for if we have died with Christ. Verse 9, death no longer has dominion over Christ from being raised from the dead. Verse 10, the death he died, he died to sin once for all. Verse 11, so you must consider yourselves dead to sin in Christ Jesus. Verse 12, let sin therefore not reign in your body. Uh, Verse 13, presenting yourself as those who've been brought from death to life. In Christ we died. And we died to kill sin. Verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So we died with Christ to kill sin. We died with Christ to sever the hold sin could have on us. It's like when you get sick and you get a fever. And when I was young, I thought that a fever was sickness and a fever was bad. And as I've gotten older, I've learned that's not how biology works. Actually, a fever is technically a really good thing, unless it gets too hot that it cooks your body. But the whole point of the fever is to cook the disease. So your body's warming up to kill the bacteria or the virus or whatever so that you are no longer diseased. The only reason that dangerous fevers are dangerous is because they get too hot for the rest of your body. But the fever in itself has a purpose. You get hot to kill the bad thing. We died with Christ to sever sin, sever sin's hold on us. That was the point of this burial and resurrection with Christ. Symbolically speaking, literally speaking on a spiritual realm, that we have died with Christ to sin. We think of this more colloquial thing that we sometimes say in the U.S., but it's reflected in a much more direct way often overseas or sometimes in families of the U.S. where like, people will say, you're dead to me. We say it jokingly sometimes in slang, but people are very serious sometimes. You know, people will change their religious beliefs or they'll you know, change the way that they go about certain life things, they'll change political party, whatever, and their family ostracizes them. You're dead to me now. I might never talk to you again, etc. That's tragic. This in Romans is glory, that we have died to sin. 
we can look at sin and say, in Christ's sin, you're dead to me. And we can be utterly serious about that because it is manifestly true in all that Jesus did for us. We have a saying in the state of New Hampshire. Their slogan is, live free or die. And the saying instead in Romans 6 would be, die to live free. As, as, the, as the fever of, of dying with Christ comes, sin is chopped off and we get to live in freedom. That is the reality of what God has given us. That doesn't mean that we never struggle with sin at all, but it is not bound to us as it was before what Jesus did. Why is that? Because of part two, in Christ we are alive. And I kept reading half verses and you kept going, why aren't you finishing? Why aren't you finishing? Because we were going to get to the alive part. So verse 4, we were buried by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Verse 5, we've been united in death. We will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Verse 7, the one who has died has been set free from sin. Verse 8, we believe that we also will live with him. Verse 9, that Christ is has died, been raised from the the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Verse 10, the life he lives, he lives to God. Verse 11, so you also are alive to God in Christ Jesus. Verse 12, present yourselves as those who have been brought from death to life. Verse 14, sin will have no dominion over you. So we've died to be free. We have died to sin, to have sin's impact and rule and reign cut off and severed. So that sin still does have an effect in life, but it does not reign over you. Verse 6, we are no longer enslaved to sin. In Christ, you've been set free from the entrapments and the curse and everything else. But so often, even though we've been freed to be free, we often behave like those with Stockholm Syndrome. And if you're familiar with, the, with Stockholm Syndrome, kind of psychological terminology has been given, but people who have been trapped in, a, like they've been kidnapped, or they've been in an abusive situation, or they've been held in a tower and forced to do whatever, like Beauty and the Beast, and then they end up loving their captor, that's called Stockholm Syndrome. So, that we've seen this happen a lot, and it's, it's kind of odd psychologically, but where you know, you're, you're kidnapped and you're with that person for two, three, four years, whatever, and you develop an odd sort of compassion and care for them where then you'll, you'll see people get freed from kidnapping and they actually don't want to be. Like they're, they're hiding and trying not to be freed because it's getting such a warped mental relationship. That's what we call Stockholm Syndrome. And we do that with sin sometimes. Like, God's like, you're freed. You're in Christ, you're free. You've died to sin. You can live free. And we're like, yeah, but it was so good. We're like, like turning back to sin. And, and I, I don't want to be free necessarily. This was fun. And it's still, it's still cool. And, and the beast, he dances, and it's great. And I can dance with him. And, you know, maybe I'll transform sin. You won't transform sin. There is no curse upon sin that's making it look beastly right now. And someday it will actually turn into a beautiful prince. Sin is sin, and it's deathly, and it's awful, and it's every other bad descriptor we could ever give to it. And when we turn back to it over and over as if it's still like this caring, compassionate master, it never was, and it never will be. Sin wants to ravage your life. So in Christ, we're alive. We're freed to be free. We're freed to exist and to enjoy life. We're not freed to then turn around and run back to sin in this warped kind of Stockholm Syndrome, like, oh, it was more comfortable, it was fun. But we see it happen. We see it happen in the history of Israel where they're like, oh, we should go back to Egypt. God's freed us to this dumb desert, and all we have is this food that he provides for us miraculously every single day, and it's amazing to see, but it's just so dumb. Like, wait, what? Stockholm Syndrome never makes sense when it's a third party looking at it, and yet when we're, when we're doing it ourselves, we rationalize it, and it makes sense to us. We have to be aware of this. 
the purpose for which we've been free, the purpose that we died, if we look back to chapter 5, is so that we will reign in life. This is chapter 5, verse 17. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. From that, Paul talks in this section about sin was dead, so you'd no longer be enslaved to it. Sin has no rule over Jesus at all as he has died and been raised, and you, like him, sin shall not have dominion over you, verse 14, since you're not under law but under grace. You have been freed in order to reign eternally with Christ, but even now to reign over your own body and person, to have yourself under Christ in charge, not to have sin in charge, and you desperately hoping that somehow you can manage to get out of this someday. And actually, actually, kind of cool. No, I'll stay here. And then Jesus is like, would you please come out? I saved you. No, that's not the point. Like, you've been freed in order to be free. You've been freed in order to have this new life that you can't even fathom what it really means to be that free. It's one of the things that we see that's tragically hard for people when they are rescued from slavery of any sort. It's like trying to fathom what it even means to be free. How do I live this life where... Now I can do whatever I want or whatever I need to or that kind of thing. We have like mini glimpses of it when we're in school and then we get out of school. Like when I was living in California and I was in seminary and Kristen was working and I was working and then Kristen wasn't working because Jane was born and I was working and studying. And so my schedule was basically wake up at like 6.30, hop on the bus, study while I was on the bus and the other bus for an hour and 15 minutes till I was at the office, at which point I put away the book and I became computer guy. Then I had computer stuff for a bit, and then I got on a train to go to a customer, and I pulled out my seminary books again, and I'm studying while I'm on the train or writing while I'm on the train. And then I'll come back to being a computer guy, and then I'm back around again, and I get home, dinner time, or sometimes 11 p.m. or whatever. But the whole day is just full of study work, study work, right? Finally graduate, and there was this thing that would happen during the study years where all the time, if I wasn't studying, I was thinking about what studying I needed to be doing you know, when I got home or whatever, kind of planning out the day, planning out the month, all that. Not in a horrible way. I know this sounds awful, but like I was fine. But it's just my brain was always active in that mode. So it was like, okay, I'm working on this. Next I'll be doing that thing. Okay, cool. Right, just organizing my day. So I graduated. I remember very distinctly one day. I'm driving up this. There, there was a highway that came along by the, the island that we used to live on. It's not as cool as it sounds, but we lived on an island. And then there's a sloping highway that goes up over. It's like a big bridge over a waterway. And I'm driving up that bridge. I'm like, okay, so now I need to, oh, uh, what do I need to do? I'm done. Like, <laughs> school's done. I, I don't have more stuff. My, my brain was lost for a second. Like, what am I supposed to do now? This is, this is how we are sometimes when we get freed, and we can't fathom what it means to actually be freed from sin or from whatever. Like, I don't know what to do with myself now. There's a whole world of good you can do. That's the great thing. Like by the Spirit's power, God's prepared good works for you to do, Ephesians 2, that you can go and do them by his strength, by his power. So by all means, turn away from sin and enjoy the good things that God's given you to do. And whether that's just hanging out with your family and being kind to one another because you're free from sin, or whether that's going and serving the poor or doing some missions trip or doing whatever else, like there's any number of wonderful things that we can do, which is part of why we have... People have often talked throughout the years about replacing sin or other things with a new affection, a new thing to do, a new hope, a good thing to pursue instead. Because if you're just like, I don't know what to do, well, often we turn back to what we know. And the unfortunate reality is we're born sinful and we sin through our lives. So what we know is sin. And so if we just let ourselves be stagnant and turn back to what we know, we're going to turn back to that familiar sin, like Stockholm Syndrome, because we don't actually hate it the way we should, the way we could. But the more that God frees us, the more that we pursue what is good and noble and just and right and everything else like him, the more we get to experience the real freedom he's called us to. So, presuming on grace should be unfathomable. In Christ, we've died. In Christ, we're made alive We're freed to be free. 
That brings us to, to this final section in verse 12 to 14 or 11 to 14. Think rightly, live rightly. And this is where we get to that point earlier, don't enthrone sin, live free in Christ. He starts this off first with, with how you think. Verse 11, so you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now consider yourselves. We've met this word before, this phrase. Abraham believed God, and it was considered to him as righteousness. Consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Same exact wording. Translated slightly differently in English to match up with how we read in English. But same word. Consider, just like Abraham's faith is counted as righteousness, just as real as all of that, that God has done by faith, transforming you, counting you right with him, reconciling you, just as real as that. Consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God and Jesus Christ. Sin, you are dead to me. I'm done with you. You're dead to me. You might still have influence, but you're dead to me. God, I'm alive to you. Like when Paul says, the life that I live, I live to Christ who died and gave himself for me. In Galatians, like this is a different sort of life that I get to live now in real freedom by his grace for him as an instrument of righteousness. And sadly, as I've alluded to earlier, there's oftentimes that we miss the point of this rescue. It's like an addict who goes back to their addiction or it's like, if you think of Megamind, I know that's where all of you were just about to go mentally. It was to a kid's cartoon movie. Bit of trivia. First time I ever saw Megamind was at David and Anna's house. So it's their fault. It's their fault that I'm referencing a fun and goofy kids movie right now. So if you don't think it's appropriate, just blame them later. You think of Megamind and, and you think of Titan. That guy. Now when you first hear him called Titan, you think it's spelled T-I-T-A-N. Later on in the movie you discover he spells it T-I-G-H-T-E-N. Because he doesn't know how to spell and you might as well tighten something, I guess. He's Titan. And for those of you who don't know the movie, I'm sorry I'm about to spoil it. But you can still watch it later. It's still great. Megamind gets him powers at one point. He's supposed to be a really good guy, a hero. He actually looks kind of heroic in this picture. That's the whole point. He's going to be the hero, and he's going to fight off the bad guys. Instead, for a variety of reasons, he takes that selfishly. He takes it for his own gain, he starts becoming the villain because he wants stuff. He like robs a bank just because he can. He does other sorts of stuff like this. Builds up his own possessions. So at one point, Megamind, who's supposed to be the bad guy in the movie, says to Titan, I can't believe you. All your gifts, all your powers, and you squandered them for your own personal gain. Like the whole point that you were given these powers was to be good and to help and to save and to rescue and instead, you've turned it all on yourself for your own personal gain. To steal, to thieve, to destroy, to carry out your anger, to accomplish your own goals. You don't get it. You don't understand. The whole point that you were given this was not this. It was that. And yet, sometimes that's exactly where we are with sin. You don't get it. The whole point of why you were freed was to be free. Like the whole point of why you were rescued from sin was to be rescued from sin. You get to live free of all that. You get to pursue what's good in the Spirit's power. You get to do what's good. You get to live what's good. So think rightly. Consider yourselves dead to sin and alive in Christ Jesus. When you think of yourself, you should never think, I'm just that sinner, or I'm just the fill-in-the-blank of, of the sin that you have struggled with, whatever it is. I'm just greedy. I'm just angry. I'm just the, the lusting person. I'm just the... Ang uh, fighting person. I, I just fight with my siblings all the time. All I am is a fighter. Right? List off whatever it is. I'm the person with a messiah complex. I'm overly, you know, enabling of people who are, you know, psychologically dependent. Like, whatever you might want to list that you think is your failing, your flaw, your fault, that should never be the way that you speak of yourself or the way that you speak of other believers. Are those things we struggle with? Yes, absolutely. Do we need to kill them? Yes, absolutely. Are we defined by them? No. You are defined. Consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. 
God reckoned Abraham's faith as righteousness. You reckon yourself dead to sin and alive to God and Jesus Christ. It is every bit as serious and every bit as real. It's part of why when we talk about sin, it's both a big deal and not a big deal at the same time. It's part of why when I was, whatever, I don't know, 21 or something, I was in college, and we had a time of sharing at North Hills years ago. You might be able to get on the stage and be like, look, I had struggles with porn years ago, and that's part of what God used in my life. I could get up there and say that in front of a couple thousand people, not because I'm so cool. No, but because it's, it's something Jesus killed. And I don't, I don't just mean like, oh, he killed it in my life, I'm over it. I mean, it's sin of any sort, and that's what Jesus kills. So even when you're in the middle of struggling through something, that's still something Jesus kills. The hope is still the same regardless. So we can talk about failings and struggles and we can work through them together, not because we're already done with them and now we feel like we're buttoned up and ready to go, but because Jesus is still the answer to all of it. (laughs) Because he's still the one who saves us from all of it. And he's still the one who's provided community to help us through all of it and to be able to say, hey, brother, you're struggling with anger. You are not just the angry guy. You're struggling with depression. You are not the depressed person who no one likes. You're struggling with whatever, anxiety, fear, greed, fighting. You are not that. If you are in Christ, you are redeemed. And you struggle with that, yes, and fight it. Please do. By the Spirit's power, sin still matters to kill. (laughs) And let's shred it and cut its neck and tell it it's dead. But you are not defined by your sin. You are dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. So therefore, we're finally going to get to the point you've been asking this whole time, why did you use the verb enthroned? Verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Verse 14, for sin will have no dominion over you. It will not rule over you because you are not under law but under grace. So here's the thing that Paul basically says by this statement, and here's the challenge to you. The only way that sin gets to reign in your life is if you put it on the throne. Sin is not in charge over you. Sin is not your king, your ruler. Satan may be the prince of the power of the air, but he has nothing over you if you are in Christ. Sin has nothing over you if you are in Christ. The only way sin it's on the throne of your life is when you put it there, when you allow it to be there, when you enthrone sin and decide to serve it. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members, your body parts, to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Don't present yourselves to sin for unrighteousness. Present yourselves to God for righteousness. This is the choice you have of who you're going to serve, of who's going to be sitting on the throne of your life, of how you are going to reign yourself, rule yourself under the rule of another. You have the opportunity to say, sin, you're dead to me. God, I'm alive to you. Spirit, please help me to rule myself likewise. I am dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. God, give me the strength to present myself to you continually for righteousness, for good. So don't enthrone sin. Instead, live in that freedom you've been given in Christ. There was the great, you know, theologian of the past, Descartes, Rene Descartes. Not actually a theologian for all of you who don't know who he is, but he was a thinker, philosopher from France, in the 1700s, I think, part of the overall Enlightenment movement. And he famously said, as as he was pondering his own existence and how he could prove his existence, so he's sitting there breathing, and that's not good enough for him. (laughs) He's to prove he's actually alive and he exists. But we get into weird things with philosophy, right? So the conclusion he came to was, I think, therefore I am. So I guess he's going, how do I prove that I exist? You know what? Because I think. That's kind of the the conclusion he came to, which actually says a lot about enlightenment and the way that we think post-enlightenment, that we kind of put our own brains on the throne. (laughs) It's like, the best way I know that I live is because I think. My brain works. That proves that I exist. That's what we've turned to. And that's actually, it's impacted the way that a lot of what we do. 
the way that we rationalize and the way that we trust our own opinions more than anyone else, et cetera, et cetera. But I would challenge us to flip that a little bit in what we're seeing here in Romans. I am, therefore I think. I am dead to sin, alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, I think that. Therefore, I I teach myself what is true. My identity is redeemed in Christ. I am free in Christ. In Christ, I am becoming everything God means me to be. We read in Colossians 3 that who you are is hidden with Christ in God and will be revealed in that day when he is revealed. So like the person that he's making you into, the sanctified, glorified person, is already hidden with him. It's already there. There's, God already knows the path that he's leading you on to perfect you, to make you like Jesus and, and bring you into eternity. That's the path that you're on. So it's there. It's true of you. Therefore, think. Therefore, reckon. Therefore, consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. There's a little bit to be said here of, of the nature of confidence versus flippancy. Because the, the truth that God has saved us, the truth that we are no longer under the law but under grace, the truth that we're rescued should never lead us to flippancy like sin doesn't matter. Again, sin absolutely matters to kill it, but it does not define us. That's the confidence side. What defines me and, and my identity is bound up in Jesus and being with him, being found in him, so when it's, when it's how, how are you any good in life, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not any good inherently. There's nothing. And the fact that I'm saved and rescued and following Jesus doesn't mean I inherently have something to offer. I'm in Christ. He is my hope. He is the one. I'm part of his family and his team and his disciples. And he stands there perfectly having made, it, made the way. That's the point of confidence. If we're just like, oh, we're good, doesn't matter. God has to love people. He's loving after all. He shows mercy. It's great. I can do whatever I want. That's flippancy, and that's going to lead you to hell. Confidence is on its way to eternity with God and knows I'm bought. I'm part of his family. I'm here, and he loves me no matter what because he's done it, and he said he would. And he's good to his word, and his promises are true. So think rightly. Live rightly. You're called to reign in life. Sin does not rule you anymore. Will you enthrone sin or will you live for God? This is the calling that that Paul gives us in this. Because again, if we're to skip that middle section where he develops the in Christ you died, in Christ you live foundation for what he's saying, then we get this. What should we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Verse 12, or verse 11. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. That's that's the flow of the main point he makes. And everything about being in Christ is supporting that fact. So if you feel like I don't get what this whole in Christ thing means, well, you want to dive in there (laughs) because it's huge. If you're sitting here and like that's never been true of me, then please come talk to any of of, me, David, any of us. (laughs) We would love to talk with you about salvation and what it means to, to really be in Christ and follow him. But if you are in Christ, that is your hope. The reality that you have died with Christ and you're raised with Christ and you get to live that identity. And therefore, should we continue in sin and the grace may be bound, is unfathomable. It's not because, oh, people who debate this way are just idiots or whatever. No, it's, it's unfathomable because you've been totally changed in your identity who you are, whose family you're in, etc. All that is true of you in Christ is the reason why it's unfathomable to think, I should sin that grace may abound. I should sin that grace may abound is the way that people who don't understand grace speak. We see it happen. We see people talk about it around us in our churches at times, in culture at large, that God has to save, that he has to 
love. We don't understand justice and judgment when we're making claims like that. But for those of us who are in Christ, we can know what grace truly is, and we can know, no, we don't sin that grace may bound. We enjoy, rejoice in what grace already did, and we live for God. So that's that. Don't enthrone Christ. Or sorry, don't enthrone sin. Live free in Christ. I smashed it together. <laughs> don't enthrone sin. Don't let it rule. Don't make it reign where it doesn't deserve it. Live free in Christ. Embrace the freedom you've been given. You are freed in order to be free. You're redeemed in order to be redeemed. You've been rescued to live out that rescue. And sometimes it feels awkward and uncertain. Sometimes it feels like you don't know what the next steps are because you no longer have those rules and regulations that you used to live by or whatever. But in Christ, by the Spirit's grace, you get to live free and for him. You get to present yourself to God. God, here I am. I'm alive to you. Please use me. Please help me to be faithful to you. That is your day-to-day calling as those who've been redeemed from, from the sin that otherwise would have wrecked your existence. So let's pray. God, thank you for all that you have done in this. Thank you for redeeming us and bringing us from death to life in Jesus. Thank you for the fact that he has done what we never could have done, that he's taken the punishment for sin that we never could have taken, that you knew in your justice sin must be punished, and you also knew that if you brought that punishment on all of us, we would all be unmade and gone forever. There was no one righteous, no, not one, and yet Jesus came. While we were still sinners, he came and died for us. And we've been rescued into his family to be in Christ. And we can look at this and say, yes, by no means shall we sin, that grace may abound. We can rejoice in grace and your goodness, and we can live for you. And Pray that you would help us in our thoughts and in our actions to think rightly, to live rightly, that we would never enthrone sin that we would always live free in you, that even as we struggle with sin, we would not enthrone it. We would seek to kill it. We would look sin and square in the face and say, you're dead to me because I'm alive in Christ. And that as you continue to free us and you continue to give us a a gospel-fueled vulnerability, a gospel-fueled confidence, that it would make us ever more capable of serving you faithfully and proclaiming the truth to the people around us, whether that's family or friends or coworkers or people at the stores. Or I pray this Saturday, the opportunity for going out around the community that people are, would be able to prioritize that and show up and just enjoy getting out to local neighborhoods or shops or whatever and sharing the good news that Jesus is Lord and he's raised that these things would define the hope of our lives and the hope of our existence as we pursue you. In Jesus' name, amen.